Hello everybody, welcome back to Physics 425. Um, what we talked about last time was the grand partition function and grand potential for a system of bosons and we considered the entire system, so all the different quantum mechanical energy levels. And we calculated this grand potential in both the high temperature and low temperature limits. What I have here is the approximate expression that we got for the high temperature limit. And this can be evaluated if we pick a specific energy dependence, uh, or sorry, if we pick a specific K dependence for the energy um, for a collection of non-interacting particles, that energy dependence is H bar squared K squared over 2M. So it's just pure kinetic energy. If you sub that in and then evaluate the integral, what we could do is calculate the grand potential and then we can take its temperature derivative to find the entropy. The entropy can also be related to the heat capacity and if we do all of that, what we find is a heat capacity that is constant, independent of temperature. And so it's just equal to 3 halves NKB and that's the classical result that we would expect for a uh, monotonic system of bosons. Or in fact, because it's the high temperature limit, it doesn't matter if it's bosons or fermions. Uh, then we looked at the low temperature limit. And in the low temperature limit, what we did is we uh, assumed that the chemical potential divided by KBT goes to zero as T goes to zero. And in that limit, we got the following expression for the grand potential. Again, if we assume epsilon is h bar squared k squared over 2m, we could plug that in and actually just evaluate the integral. And what we would find is a, an entropy that is proportional to t to the 3 halves. And then because the heat capacity is the t temperature derivative of the entropy multiplied by t, it also has a t to the 3 halves dependence. So if we were to try to plot what we found by this analysis, if we were to plot the heat capacity as a function of temperature, we would find that at high temperatures, the heat capacity is about constant. And then at low temperatures, it has this t to the 3 halves dependent. So it's a, a little bit faster than linear in t, but slower than t squared. And so if you draw that, maybe it looks something like this. And we didn't calculate what happens at intermediate temperatures between this high temperature and low temperature limit. But, you know, somehow they would have to connect. And so I'm not too worried about what those details are. And so maybe it looks something like this. If you go and actually look up some data for the heat capacity of liquid helium, what you find is something that's quite radically different. In fact, at the lowest temperatures, it's very small heat capacity, and then it rapidly rises. And then there's a discontinuity, and it looks something like this. So it uh, has a really complicated temperature dependence and looks nothing like what we calculated. So the goal of the next few videos will to be to see if we can kind of resolve this problem. Can we calculate the correct or something that looks more like the experimentally measured data. We're not going to be, we'll focus our attention on the really low temperature part of this plot and see if we can re reproduce some of the aspects that exist in the in the measured data. So this is the measured data is in red and let me clean this up a little bit and the experiment or the calculated, the calculated curve is in black. Okay, and so 
just some comments is that um, the measured and calculated data look very different. Um, and so it was, it was a person named Landau that really solved this problem. And so his name was Lev Landau. And so he was a Russian. And so he realized that the heat capacity calculated for the Bose-Einstein condensation of a dilute gas, um, which is what we just calculated, right? We calculated this T to the three halves dependence. And so for a dilute gas of particles, what we assumed is that the energy was this h bar squared k squared over 2m. Um, so Landau realized that that did not match the measured CV of superfluid liquid helium-4. Um, the resolution, as you might have guessed, is that when we have a liquid of helium-4, it's not a collection of non-interacting particles. So liquid for helium is not a collection of free particles. So there are some interactions that complicate things. So they're interacting. What Landau did is he predicted the shape of epsilon k, so the k dependence of epsilon, that would give the correct, so when it was used in the calculations that we're doing, it would give the correct shape for the thermodynamic properties of liquid helium-4. So Landau predicted the shape of epsilon k versus k. And so if you keep in mind that um, h bar k is momentum, then what we're really looking at is the energy versus momentum curve. For non-interacting particles, that's a quadratic. It's a k squared dependence. So momentum is p is h bar k. And so this is often called a dispersion relation. So he picked the k dependence of epsilon that would give, uh, I'm going to insert a slide here. Let's see. Um, oh, I think I know how to do it. So let's add a page. Okay, good. So that would give the correct temperature dependence of the thermodynamic properties of superfluid helium-4, liquid helium-4. Okay, um, so I'm going to draw his prediction. Um, but before we do that, let's just take a look at what the measured data for the heat capacity of liquid helium-4 looks like. And so this is actual experimental data for 
liquid for helium. Um, remember that uh, T lambda, the superfluid transition temperature, is about 2.2 Kelvin. I think it's 2.17 Kelvin. And so we're looking at the temperature range from 0 to 2 Kelvin. So we're looking only at the superfluid state. Um, and the first thing you can notice is that it's very small for temperatures below 1 Kelvin and then increases rapidly above that temperature. So there's like a, an activation temperature. Once you exceed that temperature, then the heat capacity increases dramatically. And this dependence here is like a exponential. And so one of the features that we would want to find in our uh, calculated heat capacity is that above a certain threshold temperature, the heat capacity increases very rapidly exponentially. I'm going to look at the same data on a log scale. In fact, it's a log log scale. Both axes are on a log scale. And so here is above about, I don't know, 0.8 or so Kelvin. That's where you get this activation and then the heat capacity begins to rise rapidly. Below that, what we find is that on a log-log scale, the temperature dependence is linear. And whenever you have a linear set of data on a log-log scale, then you know it obeys some power law where the power is determined by the slope of the linear line. And so this line has a slope of three. And so that line is a temperature cubed dependence. And so what we find then is at low temperatures at, so let's say very low temperatures, the heat capacity seems to be proportional to T cubed. Um, whereas what we calculated for our non-interacting system was T to the three halves. And then um, above around, I don't know, 0 0.8 to 1 Kelvin, CV increases rapidly. And so those are the two features that we would like to see in our theoretical calculation for this heat capacity. Okay, and so what did Landau predict? Landau's prediction. He predicted the following. So here's the K dependence and here's epsilon of K. And so first of all, if we had non-interacting particles, we would just have this K squared dependence. And so this is non-interacting system would have epsilon is equal to h bar squared k squared over 2m. Okay, what Landau predicted is that there would be initially a linear dependence of epsilon on k. And then eventually that would go through some kind of peak and then there would be a minimum over here where this is kind of parabolic and then increases again. And so this linear portion is called a phonon dispersion relation. And what we'll find, uh, I think today, is that the linear part is responsible for the very low temperature behavior, the T cubed uh, dependence that we saw. And so the linear part of epsilon k versus k is responsible for the very low temperature uh, T cubed dependence. 
of CV, the heat capacity. Um, and then the other important part of this curve is this quadratic section here. And so this is a parabolic type. It's a K squared dependence, but it's not centered on zero. Uh, in fact, it's offset so that it's at K zero. And this minimum here happens at an energy of delta. This is often called the roton part of the dispersion curve. And we'll come back to that uh, probably not today, but in the next video. And we'll find that the parabolic part of this curve gives the activated exponential dependence of CV. So the parabolic part of epsilon k versus k gives the activated exponential part of CV versus T at higher temperatures. By higher temperatures, I mean just not the very low temperature part. It's still, we're still always talking about uh, T less than T lambda, which is 2.17 Kelvin. So it's still a low temperature limit, but it's not the, it's higher temperature than where we see the T cubed dependence of CV. All right, good. So before we get into this calculation, I wanted to just say a few things about Landau because he had a, a really pretty interesting life. So Lev Landau, and so he lived from 1908 to 1968. Um, and so he is a Russian. Um, most of the information that I'm going to kind of give you here in the next few minutes comes from a, a scientific American article. And I'll leave a link to that article in the description. But the article is called, um, I think it's called the Top Secret Life of Lev Landau. If that's not the exact title, it's pretty close to what the title is. Um, so the first bit of information is that he was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1962, and so this was for his pioneering theories in condensed matter, and in particular, especially liquid helium. So a lot of what we're going to talk about was directly related to his Nobel Prize. Um, so Landau, what are some of the facts from his life? He qualified for university at 13, but his parents held him back. So they didn't let him go right away. He published uh, his first research paper at 18. He got his PhD at 21. He also published a series of textbooks with a former student uh, Lifshitz. And so you may have heard of the Landau Lifshitz series of 
books. They're usually graduate level books. Um, and so they're, they're famously quite difficult, uh, terse. So they're called the course of theoretical physics. And there's 10 volumes. And as I said, they're graduate level books. Okay, um, he also call, uh, created a series of exams called the theoretical minimum. You know, and so you might interpret these as kind of the minimum amount of knowledge in theoretical physics that you ought to have if you're going to, say, go study with Landau or, or something like that. Um, and so from the years 1934 to 1961, uh, so what is that, 27 years, uh, 43 candidates passed his theoretical minimum exams. And so you can see his standards were quite high. Okay, um, he also advocated for his students to practice free love. Um, he believed in socialism, but was arrested in 1938 for comparing Stalinish rule with Hitler and Mussolini. Uh, so while arrested, he was forced to stand for seven hours per day. And he said that he would have died if he had to stay in prison for another six months. Um, I th right. Okay. While he was arrested, uh, another famous physicist, Kapitza, uh, Kapitza, he wrote to Stalin urging for Landau's release. So after he did get out of prison, so after release from prison, Landau developed theories to explain Kapitza's experimental data on superfluid helium-4. So uh, Kapitza was rewarded for his efforts to help Landau. So Landau developed the theory to explain Kapitza's experimental results on superfluid helium-4. Um, and so we already mentioned when we drew this uh, K dependence of epsilon that Landau predicted, the parabolic part of that K dependence uh, is going to be called the roton part of the dispersion relation. And so this work led to the discovery of rotons, which eventually led to his Nobel Prize. Um, so despite being arrested for criticizing Stalin, Landau later worked oh, 
worked on the Soviet nuclear bomb project. And ultimately, he would win, believe it or not, the Stalin Prize and get a hero of, uh, sorry, a hero of socialist labor honor. Through his life, Landau was admitted to a psychiatric hospital six times. And this was not voluntary, so involuntarily. Um, then near the end of his life, I think 1968, he died. He had a car accident. He was involved in a car accident in 1962. He was in a coma for two months as a result of the accident. Uh, he was declared dead several times. Um, and it's said that he was never really that productive as a physicist after the car accident. And in 1968, died in 1968 due to complications associated with this accident. One more thing I'll say uh, is that he developed the Landau's productivity scale. And it's a log scale. So if your productivity is one more or less than someone else's, that's 10 times a factor of 10. And so the best you could do on the scale is zero. And so Newton was given the top rank, most productive. And then Einstein followed with a 0 0.5 rating. And then kind of the, the people who developed quantum mechanics, so Bohr, Heisenberg, Dirac, Schrodinger, they were all given a ranking of one on this scale. And then that's after that Landau put himself. So this is two to two and a half he gave himself. Um, you know, I would I would would dread to see where I fall on a scale like that. Uh, <laughs> so anyways, so let's go back and start thinking about this prediction for the dispersion relation that uh, Landau pre came up with for to try to explain the thermodynamic behavior of superfluid liquid helium-4. And we'll start with looking at the linear portion of this. Um, okay, so let's investigate what happens. If we try to use Epsilon k is proportional to k. Um, 
And so what we'll do is we'll say the proportional proportionality constant is u1 h bar times k. So uh, this is going to be called the phonon contribution. Ultimately to the specific heat. So what we'll do is we'll write down the grand potential and we will try to evaluate it. Then what we can do is we can take a temperature derivative to get the entropy. And we'll use the entropy to then calculate the heat capacity. Okay. So this is going to be the grand potential. And now we're focusing on the so-called phonon contribution. So our approximate low temperature form of the grand potential was V over 2 pi squared times KBT. Then we integrate from 0 to infinity of K squared ln of 1 minus E to the minus epsilon of K. Now, for epsilon K, we're going to use this linear relationship now, divided by KBT, and then it's a K integral. Okay, so we'll make a substitution. X is U1 H bar K over KBT, so just the argument of the exponential. And that means DK is KBT over U1 H bar dx. Okay, so after this substitution, we still have a v over 2 pi squared. We still have a kbt. Uh, when we put in the k squared, we'll get a kbt over u1 h bar. And we'll get two factors of that, so it'll be a 2 here, and it'll be integral of 0 to infinity of x squared, and then we have ln of 1 minus e to the minus x. And then we have a dk, which we're going to write as dx, and then we get another factor of the kbt uh, over u1 h bar. So we'll change this squared out front to a cubed. This integral, it turns out, can be solved. And so I just put this into Maple. You could put it in whatever software you like. And if you evaluate that integral, you'll get pi to the fourth power over 45. OK, so then this grand potential, the phonon contribution, is going to be equal to, we'll get a minus sign. And then we have, let's see, a v. And then we have pi to the fourth divided by pi squared. So that's pi squared in the numerator. 2 times 45 is 90. And then we have four factors of kbt. And u1 h bar cubed. Okay, and so that's it. When we go calculate the phonon contribution to the entropy, it is going to be the derivative with respect to t at constant v and mu. Uh, and so when we do that derivative, we just get a 4 that comes out. And so we would have 2 pi squared v over 45. Uh, we'd have a KB over U1 H bar cubed, and then we have a KBT cubed left over. And when we go calculate the heat capacity, the phonon contribution, it's T times the derivative of the entropy with respect to T. Uh, so that brings down a factor of 3. The 45 becomes a 15. And so we would get 2 pi squared v over 15. Kb over u1 h bar cubed. Um, the t becomes a t squared, but then we multiply by t again, so it's t cubed. 
and so it's kb t cubed. And so here we see that the linear portion of Landau's epsilon k versus k gives CV proportional to T cubed, which is the expected, or let's not say expected, let's say which agrees with the experimental data at very low temperatures. What we haven't done, and what we'll say for next time, is we still need to produce the activated or enhanced CV at temperatures near but below the superfluid transition temperature T lambda. Okay, good. So with that, we'll stop here and we will try to redo this calculation using not uh, uh, epsilon proportional to K, but um, an epsilon that is parabolic, but offset in K and offset uh, on the energy axis. All right, thanks very much.